Great. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Nikki Dell. I'm a faculty member at Cornell Tech. Neha is at Georgia Tech. Uh, we're going to split up this presentation less uh, for having it, taking equal credit, but more for splitting the workload, I think. So we're really happy to be here and talk to you about the ins and outs of HCI for development, which I'm going to use HCI for D as the acronym for that. Um, and what we really wanted to do was provide a couple of different perspectives on HCI for D research. First, for people inside the community who might be intimately familiar with the concerns and the goals that this work seeks to address. Um, but also for the larger community, the larger CHI community, particularly as we grapple with the theme of uh, CHI for good. We wanted to provide the insights and experiences of the field of HCI for D in the hopes that we can offer something to the larger community. And so what we wanted to do was provide a concise, high-level overview of the work and the goals um, and the domains that it's worked in and the people that it's seeking to help um, and offer the insights that a lot of these researchers have put together over the years in one place where for newcomers to the field they can find that all um, and hopefully learn from that. So we focused on the last six years of work um, from 2009 to 2014 and we're building on a variety of other papers that have also sought to provide these meta-level insights. The last major review of HCI4D was in 2009 by Ho and colleagues um, and they had 65 different articles that they looked at so we have a few more than that. Um, but there's a variety of other papers that have, have tried to do this we have done it more recently, so there's been no, as I said, no other reviews since 2009. But also we're combining the qu quantitative data of looking at these papers with insights from experts in the field. So it's kind of a nice balanced perspective in that way. So we started out by doing an online survey to try and identify what are the publication venues that people care about, where they're submitting their work, where it's getting accepted, where they want to submit it. And from this, we distilled down to 11 HCI or ICTD venues that we focus on, and I'll talk about those in detail in a second. We then went through these, uh, the proceedings from these conferences for the last six years. For ICTD conferences, we looked for papers that had an HCI focus. For HCI conferences, we looked for papers that had a focus on marginalized communities or ICTD. And from this, we ended up with 259 papers that fit the bill for HCI for D. And we've analyzed them according to the domain that they were targeting, the people, the country, and I'll, I'll talk about all of those details shortly. And then we went and we did qualitative interviews with 11 expert researchers in this field, um, and that's what Neha is going to talk about in a little bit. So let's start with the bird's eye view of the field. As I mentioned, we looked at 2009 up to 2014. Uh, you can perhaps tell from this graph that there's no real pattern here in terms of the number of papers that are being published every year, and this is just summed over all the conferences. It's certainly influenced by conferences that are held either every 18 months or every other year, um, as opposed to annually. But as I mentioned, in Ho and her colleagues' work, they had a total of 65 papers, whereas we have 259 from the last six years, so hopefully that speaks to the growth of the field. When we look at where the work has been published, uh, ICTD has been the biggest venue, um, followed by CHI. And perhaps what's more striking here is that venues like Ubicomp or WIST only have two or three papers across this entire period. And hopefully that's highlighting some room for growth in those areas. Uh, we then looked at where the work was conducted. So we're, target, we're looking here not at the countries where the researchers are from, but more where the research is actually taking place. And by far, uh, Asia was the focus. In fact, there were 108 papers that were based in India, um, probably due to, in part, to Microsoft Research India has a very productive lab there. Um, the next highest was 27 from South Africa, so India was really um, in the lead, but it, there was work done in 48 different countries, 43 of which were low- and middle-income countries, um, so incredibly diverse set of uh, places to work. We then analyzed who the work was focusing on, 
And so we identified ground level users as being individual. So these would be individual patients or individual farmers, for example, who were using technology as opposed to human access points, which we identified as being people a little bit higher up in the um, stakeholder system. So this would be teachers or health workers who themselves are facilitating access to services through technologies. Um, the collective entities referred mostly to organizations like non-governmental organizations or ministries, perhaps UNICEF as the talk we just had. Um, and then general users were papers that didn't really define any particular population and seemed to be targeting humanity as a whole. There's been an a embracing of different methods in this work. So 134, which is about half of the papers, were primarily qualitative, um, with 38 being quantitative, and then 79 having mixed methods and using both. And we think that it speaks to the um, strengths of HCI in embracing these different epistemological leanings um, and has been something that HCI for D and ICTD has certainly benefited from um, because I think HCI is, is in general uh, really good at this kind of diverse embracing of different methods. Uh, we, we then looked at what the technologies uh, were being developed or were being deployed. Unsurprisingly, basic and feature phones were the lion's share of work with 120 papers focusing on those. Perhaps surprising is that not very many papers are actually looking at smartphones yet in these contexts, 27 in the last six years, and of that I think 23 of those were in the last three years. So smartphones are really still quite a new phenomenon, but there's been a real drop off of focus on anything like laptops or desktops. And then finally, we looked at the domain areas that this work has uh, focused on. And at the top, I hope you can see those categories. Uh, the three that really stood out were education, access, and health. Um, these were the lion's share of the work. And access referred to access to the internet, promoting access to computing in general. Um, and that was definitely a focus. So Neha is now going to talk about the more grittier, insightful part of the paper. So we thought at first that we had learned so much from reading all of these 259 papers that we could write a full paper just about the challenges and opportunities of doing HCI 4D work. But we found out quickly, the hard way, I think, uh, that we were mistaken. And through no small number of rejections and iterations, um, we realized that even with 15 years of work, under our belts, we didn't really have the final say on the field. So um, what we decided to do then was to actually um, interview the experts who had given us these, uh, you know, I mean, certainly not the same reviewers, but the reviewers who had given us this insightful feedback. Um, and uh, we spoke with 11 of them, as Nikki mentioned. Um, uh, this was by no means an exhaustive list of the strongest or the best researchers in HCI 4D, but it was aimed at prioritizing a balance of geographies, gender, domains, and methodologies. And together, these researchers have contributed to about 81 of the papers that were part of our review. I will now talk about these interview findings um, in brief, and I'm breaking them down into two chunks, uh, the ground we've covered thus far and the road that lies ahead. So we organized our findings around these four key themes. One, understanding what exactly HCI 4D means. Two, um, discussing how the community has evolved and how it might continue to grow. Three, identifying uh, major trends in technologies, in human infrastructures, and research contributions that have influenced this field. And four, deconstructing notions of development as they pertain to this work. We asked our participants what HCI 4D meant to them, and we found that it uh, at once represents many things. A body of work looking at particular populations or places that HCI has perhaps neglected, a community of scholars spread across the world with common research interests, a keyword for publications, a club defined by strong Euro-American values, socially motivated computing, and a natural progression of work that goes back to when technology was first seen as a cure for underdeveloped economies. It is perhaps just a new name for an old idea, as one participant shared. Several refer to it as a crossing over of disciplines, such as computer science, social science, and design. 
with the common goal of making technology more accessible to people who have so far been excluded. When we asked how the field had evolved, we heard that though it had grown uh, considerably, critical mass was missing. There is a need for more focused community efforts. Suggestions we received were along the lines of organizing conferences differently so that people in developing countries had the resources to attend, as well as allowing for remote participation and encouraging new ways of community interaction and knowledge sharing. I do want to mention that we took a small step towards this goal with a 75-person uh, three-day CHI workshop that Susan also helped uh, organize in, in no small um, uh, measure. And we're grateful also that Sikai sponsored the attendance of participants from 19 other countries, some of which had never been represented at CHI before. ACI 4D work has moved towards being less technologically deterministic than before, with, as one participant said, people calling BS on the hype, and aims for a more nuanced and holistic view of the role of technology in development. As another participant remarked, we have a much more realistic way of thinking about the role of technology in the context of everything else and the broader space. With regards to major trends in HCI 4D research, we found that smartphones are a step back in some ways. The trend towards smartphones, as shown by our survey findings, concerned our participants because smartphones do not have the same power profile and robustness as basic phones. An Android phone will last for two years compared to a basic Nokia phone that would last for 10. The ecosystem has expanded to other issues such as battery life, robustness, sustainability, power, OS updates, and more. There are also the relatively slower changes in human infrastructures. As one participant said, just because the physical infrastructure has improved doesn't mean the human infrastructure has improved. Those things don't change overnight. Another said, I think one of the encouraging trends is that for a long time we were thinking of the user as the consumer of information. But in the last few years, they've become the producers of content. IVR, for instance, is allowing them to do that. So is HCI 4D really for development? What does the D mean? One of the differences we heard was that um, HCI is about publishing early, while development studies do deep, patient, slow evaluations. Thus, HCI 4D often stirs the imagination, but doesn't go all the way to development. We publish and we move on to a new project, even if there is the aspiration to do more. Some of our participants agreed with the following view. First, show an output that suggests some kind of impact or influence. Second, show that this out output could lead to an outcome. The most successful is to go all the way to an outcome. But all three are contributions. They all have a special role in science. If you're actually changing an outcome and showing it, then that has a great deal of weight. But it can take years. In summary, the responses we received from our participants suggested that HCI 4D is for development outputs as much as it is for development outcomes, where development may be defined concretely in terms of Millennium Development Goals or the more recent sustainable ones, externally as an objective of collaborators, broadly in terms of happiness and well-being, or simply in terms of geographic locations. We view this approach as generative, and critically so for a community that is in its formative stages. Now for the road that lies ahead. These are the essential questions that were raised by our participants. One, how can we further build capacity? And there are already efforts underway, like I mentioned with the workshop and with conferences such as Africa. Um, two, how can we broaden the scope of HCI 4D and recognize that it isn't about context in some faraway, marginalized locations, but also frequently in our neighboring communities here in the US and in other developed countries? Um, three, how can we engage with a wider audience and be more a part of mainstream HCI because we're dealing with questions that are relevant to the non-HCI 4D HCI community as well. And I'll talk about these two questions in a little more depth. How can we design for non-traditional settings and how can we improve interactions for diverse users? Um, several participants called for a stronger focus on designing for non-traditional computing environments. One participant asked, why would you have an office, QWERTY key keyboard, desktop metaphor, textual interface for people who don't think about things in that way? The traditional appliances and systems embed middle-aged white guys from the Pacific Northwest. They are the ones in the corner office whose language is premised in QWERTY. 
The appliance is really focused on that context, and no wonder it can be alienating to different contexts. HCI 4D is about breaking out of these rich white male U.S. systems into all kinds of other systems. Who speak, read, so how can we improve interactions for diverse users who speak, read, think, and engage with technologies differently from one another? One participant shared, the whole spoken assistant thing is interesting. It's completely a first world app, but it could be so huge for poor, low literate people. We also heard that it would be extremely challenging to internationalize these services for diverse populations around the world. You can internationalize a GUI fairly easily. If you want to internationalize Siri or Cortana, it's basically impossible. The cost of internationalizing these personal assistants, uh, I don't think people have appreciated this yet. Now for our main takeaways. Our findings show that the movement from preliminary research to substantive bodies of work that have made an impact, we also provide a unique look at how HCI 4D has grown, intellectually and as a community, and highlight areas that we need to focus on if we are to continue this advancement. HCI 4D strives to understand users and contexts that are still little understood, and to design and deploy technologies for these users and contexts. Highlighting HCI 4D work can present a diverse and balanced view of the world, stress the ways in which human computer interactions can directly benefit all sections of society, leading, we aspire, to greater good, and allow the larger HCI community to rec recognize the assumptions they might make when they work in resource rich settings alone. With that, I come to the end of our talk. We are most grateful to these folks, not only for giving us their inputs and feedback, but also just for being incredible researchers and being an incredible source of inspiration to our community, without whom we would likely not be here. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki and Neha, and we have time for one or two questions. Thank you. My name is Anirudh Joshi from IIT Bombay. Uh, so the, thank you for a wonderful paper, and congratulations for getting your paper accepted at CHI and winning an award. Uh, and I, obviously, uh, there are many things that resonate with what I have felt, and so, and uh, I just came to the paper also, so but not gone into the details. But one thing really stuck in my throat, and I think this is more of a chicken and egg kind of a problem, which is that I mean I was looking at the list of papers that you looked at, uh, or the conferences that you looked at, and none of them are from developing countries. Whereas there are quite a few developing country conferences. And I know that these will probably not go very well with reviewers, and there's always a sort of a bias to selecting. But you also, on the other hand, acknowledge that you know many of the developing country contributors do not come to these conferences. So, and then there is this natural self-selection of uh, selection bias that kind of creeps in. So, you know, the, the, I mean, you said there are 108 p papers about India, but uh, your review about India HCI is missing. And similarly for Africa, I, I, didn't, I didn't notice the slide went off very fast, but I didn't notice Africa there, or I didn't notice the CHI UX uh, conference that happens in Indonesia, and so on. So, so, I mean, how do you grapple with this? And do, do you think, do you, I mean, I don't know if you acknowledge this to be a limitation of our process here. Um, so yes, we agree with everything that you said, and yes, it's absolutely true that there are there is work that is not represented in our paper, and we did struggle with that. I think uh, which is why we started with the process of actually uh, doing a survey and sending it out to everyone that we knew that was working in the space, and so certainly that was limited by the people that that we knew um, in the space. That's not to say at all that that. No, no we, I'm saying the reviews of the conferences, particularly. I mean, yeah, I mean. The people always, I mean, you'll have a limited circle, but the conferences that you reviewed are... Yes, no, no, even for the conferences, so that was part of our methodology. So we had actually sent out a survey to ask people um, what conferences they published in, what conferences they had published in, in the last five years, in the next five years, and so on. So, um, okay. uh, and, and then we took the, the top 10, there was a tie at the 10th place, so we took the top 11 um, to, yeah. um, to look at papers, yeah. But just to add that hopefully the next paper like this in five years will be able to include things like Africa and other conferences that are starting to happen. They haven't happened yet. Certainly Africa hasn't happened yet. But Okay. Thank you again. Thank you.